When did the French get so good at football? Perennial losers when I was a child. Uh, the defending World Cup champions are in their second consecutive final now. Their fourth since 1998. Back then, a nation fetted a win on home soil and a golden blanc black beurre generation, as they said. Uh, on Wednesday night, France celebrated another black white Arab generation of players. The communion even included opposing fans, proud of a Morocco that's the first African, first Arab side to reach the final four at a World Cup. What does sporting success say about a nation and its character? Do performances on the pitch really wash away the controversy of a tournament awarded to Qatar under a cloud of suspicion? How will this World Cup be remembered more broadly? Why do sports results matter so much to so many? When the legendary Lionel Messi lines up against his Paris Saint-Germain teammate Kylian Mbappe, it's the pride of an Argentina that's otherwise in deep economic and political turmoil that's at stake. How badly do they need a win? Just one of the questions we're asking today in the France 24 debate. And joining us from Doha, France 24's Selena Sykes. Thanks for being with us. Good evening, Francois. Uh, from Coventry in England, Simon Chadwick, professor of sport and geopolitical economy at the Schema Business School. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting me back. And Ruben Slachter, journalist uh, for Eurosport, who's been a regular feature at our, our uh, daily debriefs uh, throughout the tournament. N nice to see you. Thank you. Uh, the uh, France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24Debate. Head in the stars, French daily newspaper uh, Nice Matin plays on the potential for a third star being woven onto the national team's jersey should Les Bleus win Sunday's final against Argentina. Argentina also after three stars, by the way. Uh, for now, fans, though, in this country, still savoring Wednesday night. Antonio Kerrigan has that story. French fans flooded the streets and could hardly contain their emotion. This result is so great. I'm so happy today. Kian uh, has made a bad match, but we have won, and uh, that's all the important. That's the most important things. Crowds filled the Champs Elysees, almost halting traffic after Les Bleus secured their spot in the final. A historic day for Morocco too, as the first African team to play in a World Cup semi-final, an achievement in itself and one celebrated by the African diaspora. I want to thank the Moroccan team. They played extremely well. They played not only for Moroccan country, but for all African country. I'm half French, half Senegalese. So first of all, thank you very much for the Moroccan team. Allez les Bleus! Ah! But for the 2022 Qatar World Cup, Morocco's journey ends here. Heads were in hands at this Casablanca fan zone, but supporters are proud of their trailblazing team. We are sad and disappointed, but in the meantime, very proud of our run. It's the first time that an African, Arab and Muslim country has reached the semis. Hard luck, me. We're proud of our national team. Go Morocco! We'll win next time, inshallah. And as Moroccans set their sights on future titles, France has until Sunday's final to recover from the victory. All right, thanks to the magic of Skype, we can also welcome to our conversation New York Times contributor Ida Alami. And we'll be asking you uh, uh, about the mood on the day after uh, that, that semifinal shortly. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I, I want to begin with Selena Sykes in, in, in Doha. Uh, Selena, you've had uh, a good night's sleep, I hope. Uh, time to digest it all. Uh, your thoughts on, on, on these two semifinals? Well, I think they were two very impressive, uh, entertaining semi-finals. Uh, it has to be said that maybe the French are not playing as well as expected against Morocco, but as per usual, Francois, they got the job uh, done. And well, for Argentina, it was a, a very statement performance. They laid down a statement performance ahead of going into this final with those uh, three goals against Croatia. And obviously, such a brilliant performance from Lionel Messi, nicely setting up that duel that he'll be having with Kylian Mbappe, his PSG teammate. And we'll be talking uh, about that duel. Um, Ruben Slachter, um, what we saw from the French uh, was a deep bench. Uh, 
uh, on uh, on Wednesday. Uh, you had uh, substitutes who had to come on for some of the mainstays of the club, yeah. uh, including one, um, uh, Kolomuani, who uh, I think it was the first time he touched the ball. He yeah, scored he... his first goal in, in a national team jersey. Yeah, that was a dream, a dream entrance, of course. He was a little bit lucky because he just had to put the ball in the net, but still... You have to be there, of course. Uh, I think that Didier Deschamps will be really satisfied, especially with the performance of Konate in defence, because uh, in the first game he played earlier in the tournament, he wasn't that convincing, and now he came on and he was one of the best players yesterday. So we finally saw something of the depth of the French team, because in the game that they tried something against Tunisia, they were almost all very disappointing. So I think that for Didier Deschamps, this match was for that reason also a real satisfying, uh, f satisfying game, yeah. Simon Chadwick, uh, again, I, I said it at the outset, I'm, I'm old enough to remember 1978. It was the first time that the French had been back at the World Cup uh, in, in a long, long time. And there was the sense back then that uh, France had this once in a lifetime golden generation and that once the likes of Michel Platini would go, uh, France would go back to being kind of a mid-table kind of uh, footballing nation. That didn't happen, of course. Uh, instead, they went on to win World Cups. W what is it? Well, thanks, firstly, for inviting any, an English guy on to talk about French football. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll, I'll take that as a compliment rather than, than as an insult. Um, like you, I'm uh, I'm getting on in years, and, and I do remember back to the 1970s, and, and you know, the, the French national team was never in the popular imagination of, of global football fans. Um, other nations were, were, were far more significant. And in 1984, when, of course, France, France won the European Championships, it, it was almost a surprise. You know, where, where did these people come from and who is this guy, Platini? Um, obviously, Platini and, and, and that golden generation, I think, probably sowed the seeds of a, of a legacy that we see even now today because... Of course, there are, there are young kids who are watching uh, France succeed in the 1980s, who then go on to play football and, and become the cornerstone of the 1998 World Cup victory. And, and, and this kind of generational, or should we say intergenerational influence, I think is really significant. And it's very easy, I think, for, for the French and the Germans, and for that matter, for the English, to, to take football for granted and to take success at elite level professional football uh, for granted because you know in reality the players that succeed the teams that win trophies do serve as icons and role models and do have an impact upon young kids playing young kids engaging with the game and so you know if France wins Sunday you can imagine in 10 years time or in 15 years time a new generation will come remembering you know we we, we think about you know, Mbappe, just this young guy now, but in 15 years' time, he won't be young anymore, yet he'll have served as an inspiration for the next generation. Now, let me just talk briefly on the, on this. Ruben, you come from a nation, the Netherlands, that boxes above its weight category regularly when it comes to football, in terms of the, the population versus results uh, on the field. And there was always this idea that the Dutch had this special recipe when it came to how their youth academies and the way they train. Uh, do the French uh, have some kind of secret sauce? I don't know if they have a secret sauce, but I think that they're catching up recently. Um, the Dutch, we had the, that famous total football and uh, the technical uh, formation for the players, which started in the 70s. Is it a question of athletic ability or is it a question of organization and uh, and money and how much you invest in youth no it's 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 both i mean you also need to have a lot of people who are enthusiastic already to play the game and you can now see that the football is is super popular in france especially for the youth and you're from everywhere also the <laughs> the new generation so that's that's already working uh, really well and you can see that from the french football federation and the the players are going coming through more easily and with a big club like Paris Saint-Germain who is now also uh, keeping the big big French talents in in France it's uh, yeah it's it's a snowball effect uh, uh, recently and you shouldn't forget France is one of the biggest countries in Europe so there is potentially a lot of talent of course that's uh, that's for sure there's definitely a French school of footballing just ask Morocco's uh, Paris suburbs born coach Walid Regragui France could pull off a historic repeat. When you look at what France has achieved over the last 20 years, you have to say that they're the best nation in the world today when it comes to football. And I'm proud of that because I grew up in France and I belong to that school. French football gets criticised a lot today. They criticise French coaches a lot. 
but the reality is that French players are of the highest level and the national team is currently at its best. For me, a final is always 50-50. Uh, Aida Alami, uh, uh, Walid Regragui turned a lot of heads before the semi-final when he said, if we lose, I'll be rooting for France. What was your thoughts? I mean, it's natural that he would root for the country where he was born. He is also half French. Uh, it's like when uh, President Macron yesterday went to see the Moroccan team after the game. After all, many players in, 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 on our team are also French. So it's, it's, it's natural, I would want to say. And and is there uh, the because a, a, a lot's been talked about and I, I got to say I don't the, the the FIFA calendar gods have done something incredible because uh, Morocco uh, defeated not just Belgium but also not uh, one two three countries that used to colonize them Portugal Spain and France. Well, it didn't beat France, but, <laughs> but, yeah, but, but played play, against Played France. against them, excuse me, yeah. But 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 beat France probably in, in the world's heart. I feel like uh, the world was behind Morocco last night. It was it was uh, really clear in, in everything I was reading online and newspapers and on social media. One of the emblematic images of the World Cup was that embrace between uh, Paris Saint-Germain teammates, Kylian Mbappe and... Uh, Ashraf uh, Hakimi, uh, after the final whistle, the 23-year-old striker and the 24-year-old defenders, who, who are good friends uh, uh, off to, uh, the pitch. Uh, and Aida uh, Lami, the, the, uh, uh, there is, it's also a story about Morocco, the fact that uh, uh, Morocco's team has grown over the years and uh, has ridden the wave, you could say, of globalization. I think there's something very special about this team. Uh, one of it is just they're a very charismatic, inspiring team. Um, the fact that it happened in Qatar this year is also something that I think that contributed to all the excitement around them in the sense that many Moroccan fans were able to attend the World Cup. Let's remember that during most tournaments uh, take place in, in countries where Moroccans need visas to go to. and. And for the first time, they can go. They could go in huge numbers to to follow their team, and and that was very, very, very special for Moroccans. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and one of the things that we saw early on in this tournament is that Moroccans were so enthusiastic, and you know they were filling the streets up in Qatar and making jokes and cheering for their team. And that was a big part of the World Cup for us. Uh, yes, yeah, Selena Sykes. Uh... Uh, when the host nations knocked out uh, hard and fast early in the tournament, uh, uh, we didn't know at the time that uh, they would have an Arab nation to root for all the way to the final weekend. Yeah, that's right, Francois. I don't think uh, Qatar probably could have uh, expected or hoped for a better script in this World Cup. Really, the whole of, uh, of the Arab world and Africa have been swept up by uh, Morocco's uh, fairy tale runner in this World Cup. Obviously, so much pride uh, uh, for this team that has created history, uh, becoming the first uh, team from Africa to reach a semi final of a World Cup. There was a lot of talk about this diverse uh, team with, I think, 14 uh, foreign born uh, players in the side and the manager again really managing uh, to unite them. It's a remarkable story for him as well, just three months uh, into the job. And uh, we saw it in the press conference uh, the uh, the day before uh, the game with France. It was really, they said it time and time again, it's really like a family atmosphere in this Moroccan side. We've seen, obviously, so many of their celebrations on the pitch side with their mums uh, go viral. And I think it just captured a lot of hearts. And you could tell that they were really the, the adopted team of many here in Qatar. And the support for them here in uh, Doha has been been absolutely remarkable. I've been to several of their games in the stadiums and it was by far the atmosphere that blew uh, me away the most. You couldn't uh, hear anyone else, any other supporters in the stadium. The French were completely uh, uh, drowned out by the Moroccans yesterday, uh, whistling every time the French got the ball and cheering on their side. It was an absolutely remarkable thing to witness in the stadium. Yeah, Moroccan flags, uh, uh, for the reasons you mentioned, waved well beyond uh, the country's borders. Uh, celebrations, for instance, uh, in The Hague. Uh, a reminder that uh, the team star striker, Chelsea's Hakim Ziyech, uh, was born and bred in, in the Dutch town of Dronten. So there's, there's uh, uh, Ruben Slachter. Uh, uh, again, uh, uh, everyone can uh, lay a claim to a certain degree. Uh.
Yeah, well, Hakim Ziyech, it's a, it's a special story because he was so close to playing for the Netherlands in 2015. He was, uh, he had to go to the United States for a friendly match with the Dutch team and then he got injured. And after that, they never called him back. And when Morocco called, I think also a little bit of pride was in there. And he said he followed just his heart and he went for Morocco. I think that the Dutch will regret it a little bit if you see how well he played during this tournament. But uh, yeah, there are so many of these stories. But I think it also shows how the Moroccan Football Federation is now more investing uh, in and looking after those players who are uh, who can possible play, possibly play for, their, for, for Morocco and not for Netherlands or Spain or France or, or whatever. Uh, Simon Chadwick, um, this, this sort of uh, uh, symbiosis, and there was lots of, uh, uh, as we s saw at the outset, uh, scenes uh, 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 fraternizing between Moroccan and French fans here in Paris uh, on, on uh, Wednesday evening. Would that have been the same uh, if uh, England had faced, say, the likes of Ghana? Uh, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, in, England itself as a as a team, um, it's interesting. I, I think it represents a vision of of what England could become rather than what it actually is, uh, and certainly uh, it, it's not a reflection of what England was. Um, what I particularly like about this England team is is that it's very diverse. It's very cosmopolitan. Um, you've got you know, young guys who come from not just lots of different parts of England, but lots of different parts of the world, too, to play for the team. You've got the likes of Jude Bellingham, um, who plays in Germany. This is one of the things that English players have never particularly done well in the past, is to uh, to go and play abroad successfully. And and so I think that, that as, a, as, a, as a representation of, of what a post-Brexit England and, and, dare I say, Britain might look like, uh, the England national, national team is great. But... If you think back to the past, I don't think England ever played with 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 quite so much aplomb as they they do at the moment, um, and it's tended to be a much more of a, a kind of a snarling, um, privileged almost England that have played in in tournaments like the World Cup, and and very often our elimination has al always been somebody else's fault, uh, and 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 again some of the viewers may know that you know there would be references to the, to World War Two being sung in the crowds, and very often there would be hooligan violence. So, you know, that 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 element is still in the game. It's still in the game in England. But as I say, I I think that irrespective of what England has done on the field. Um, off the field, it represents something different, something new, and a, and a positive way forward. But I think, but there is, a, but there is. Let me interrupt you here, Simon. There is a cautionary tale on this because what you're describing is a beautiful picture of diversity, and that was what the French were sold in 1998. Uh, people said, "This is great. This is the new face of France, where everybody's accepted, uh, no matter what the color of your skin." Of course, a couple of years later, the far right was in the runoff of a presidential election for the first time. And obviously the political system in Britain and, and um, the overall uh, orientations of people politically tend, tend to be much more kind of centre ground in, in, in Britain. We, we don't necessarily get the extremes at either end of the political spectrum. Um, so you know, I, I I don't think we're on the cusp of you know a new wave of nationalism, for example, on the back of some of the England uh, performances over the last two or three years. As I say, I prefer to see it in, in a much more positive light. Um, what does worry me, nevertheless, is you know in, in a post-Brexit world, uh, certainly for the English uh, living on an island, um, we do tend to set, tell ourselves stories about how great we are. And 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 what I think the the current national team does is it serves as an antidote, perhaps perhaps, to some of those nationalist tendencies. And because of the diverse nature of the squad, it does keep us connected to other parts of the world. Uh, Aida Lamy, this harks back to what you were describing earlier about uh, the question of uh, how open or closed the world is. Uh, the World Cup sells itself as this event that brings the whole world in, uh, Mor Mor and Moroccans uh, certainly come from from, from all around the globe. Uh, I wonder if Emmanuel Macron, in speaking with his Moroccan counterparts, discussed things like visas, which have been a thorny issue of late. Uh, you, do you see uh, the World Cup as this ellipse, this parenthesis, or uh, the promise that uh, the world can come together? 
It's really hard to speculate at this time. I think very often when with events like this, they do buy us a few weeks of optimism and of uh, sheer happiness, but I, I'm not sure how long it's sustainable. Um, it's true that this year has been pretty tense diplomatically between Morocco and France. Uh, it would be interesting to see if there's a turning point after this. Um, it's, it's really hard to tell or to speculate. Hard, hard to speculate. Uh, and uh, it's a parenthesis. Uh, and by the way, the, the lines of the Atlas performing, you might say, a miracle. They even got Israelis and Palestinians to root for the same team. Uh, Israel home uh, to a sizable uh, Moroccan uh, Jewish uh, community. This was the, the headline in the Jerusalem Post uh, on Wednesday ahead of that semifinal uh, match. Um, let's take a look now uh, at the other semifinal and in particular uh, what the political stakes are there. For Argentina, the first World Cup since the death of its greatest legend, Diego Maradona, who last led the Albacete to victory at the World Cup in 1986. And it's uh, the first World Cup since COVID clobbered the economy. This is a much needed break for many. The truth is that the country is in a very difficult situation, so it's a relief for all Argentinians, and it makes us forget a little bit about all the problems that we have to face every day. Simon Chadwick, how badly does Argentina need a win? And it's uh, listening to that. It's really, um, <clears throat> really interesting because obviously uh, you, you you tend to see um, uh, a World Cup dividend or a, or a political bounce as a consequence of, of teams winning tournaments. So if you look back across history, not not just the uh, the World Cup, but the Euros, South American Championships, the Olympic Games, is is there does tend to be this feel good factor that has a political consequence and and there are countries across the world uh, even where um, governments have actually called general elections in the immediate aftermath of a tournament when a team has done well because it tends to enhance their electoral prospects i think as well economically and and, and the covid element i think is an interesting one but again you you generally tend to see when teams are successful at tournaments not only during the tournament but immediately after the tournament because of this feel good factor people spend more and so given that the Argentinian economy is struggling as, uh, because of COVID, you know, potentially there is some latent demand uh, or some dormant demand within the Argentinian economy, and we'll see a pickup. But, but even so, you know, even, even if that's not the case, I think that when people feel happier, they feel better, which is the outcome of their team winning the championship, then potentially they, they will spend more than engage in more economic activity. Uh, Aida Alami, uh, uh, success... Uh, on the sports field, how much does that do for a nation's psyche, for uh, this uh, feeling of, uh, uh, of people coming together? You know, this has been an incredibly hard few years. There was the pandemic. Morocco, that relies heavily on tourism, had very strict border closure. Uh, the economy suffered greatly. And then uh, the war in Ukraine started. And... Uh, further economic difficulties and inflation. And it's just after such gru grueling years, and not to mention um, the issue with human rights in Morocco and the increasing crackdown on, on dissidents and journalists and activists. So just the mood has not been great in the last few years. And just to have so something so monumental happen has, I think, showed up significantly everybody. Last night, in, I was in Tangier. Uh, and after we lost, well, people still partied. People still partied, and I, uh, hopefully they'll be partying again uh, on Saturday after the, the, the third-place match uh, against Croatia. Those third-place matches, Ruben Slachter, do they matter? No, they don't matter, but maybe this time they matter a little bit more because I think that the Moroccans will be really, really proud if they win that for uh, that match. I've, well, maybe uh, it can be uh, co uh, confirmed by someone uh, who knows it better about Morocco. But in general, I think it's not a good, it's not important to have such kind of a game. But yeah, the game is there and I think that Morocco will do everything to still win it because being third is still an amazing achievement uh, for them. Selena Sykes, it would be quite a feat if they do win. I mean, they have players like their captain, uh, uh, Romain Saïs, who've been playing on one leg uh, at this tournament. And uh, the coach said he's going to mix up the lineup for, for that uh, third place match, get those who didn't get a chance to play to see some, so, some action. So it would be... Quite an upset if they do beat Croatia. 
I mean, they did uh, hold them to that goal as a draw, so uh, it's all to play for, really, and I think the Moroccans will come into it uh, with perhaps more heart and more uh, more heart and more desire to get that third place. I think uh, for Morocco, it's uh, maybe more important than for Croatia to get a third place. Obviously, Croatia being the runners-up uh, in 2018, I think the Moroccans will go into it more with their hearts, uh, despite, obviously, as you said, uh, uh, so much fatigue and injuries in uh, that side. And uh, just a uh, point out to Ruben, obviously also in 2018 I think when a small nation gets this far, I have a lot of family in Belgium and then back in 2018 the first place uh, finish for Belgium was celebrated too and I think that will be the same for Morocco if they manage to do it. Yeah, we mentioned earlier that uh, friendship between Paris Saint-Germain teammates uh, uh, Kylian Mbappe and Ashraf Hakimi. Well, uh, there's another teammate of, me, of uh, Kylian Mbappe who is, of course, uh, better known throughout the planet. Uh, perhaps the greatest player ever. We can have that argument and uh, devote an entire show to it another day. But <laughs> Lionel Messi of Argentina versus Kylian Mbappe of France. It's the tournament's top two scores. Oliver Ferry has that story. It's a head-on battle between two of the game's biggest stars, Lionel Messi and Kylian Mbappe. And it's hard to pick between them. Et qui est le meilleur entre les deux? Voilà. Vous posez une dure question là. On peut pas comparer les deux par rapport à sa carrière, par rapport à tout ça. Ce serait un peu une insulte à Lionel Messi de dire que Mbappé est son égal. For the past 15 months, the two players have been teammates at Paris Saint-Germain. Two global stars meeting at different stages of their career. The Argentine is 35, while the Frenchman is 23. His youth means Mbappe is the better paid, but Messi remains much the bigger draw on Instagram. Messi and Mbappe represent a duel of generations for club and country, each with an obsession for making history. With the Argentine people fully behind him, it could be Messi's year. The seven-time Ballon d'Or winner is looking to lift the one trophy that has eluded him, the World Cup. In Qatar, Argentina fans have their own opinion on the duel between the two giants. It's a legacy game. You know, it's the greatest of all time versus the, the new face of soccer. Creo que es el año de Messi por cómo vienen las cosas. The two already faced off in 2018 with Mbappe's France knocking out Argentina in the round of 16. On Sunday evening, the French striker will be looking to win his second World Cup, while Messi will be hoping to avoid a repeat of 2014 when defeating the final to Germany left him in tears. Yeah, it's uh, 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 certainly uh, uh, the dream final, uh, Ruben Slachter, for organisers here. Yeah. I don't think that the people in Qatar will be sad that it's those two teams who won the who won the semis. No. All right. So we shall see. We should see about that. Uh, we've been asking people who they think are, is is going to win the match. Simon Chadwick. Uh, he, here's an interesting point. Here, you have uh, these Paris Saint Germain stars, uh, and the the numbers are are just astounding. And and Paris Saint Germain owned by Qatar. Uh, uh, again, there's this, there's uh, the whole tournament seems to be uh, uh, about Qatar still in a way. When you look at Messi against Mbappe, yeah, I I, th I think it's really interesting. But I was asked a question earlier in the week: uh, Premier League football or the World Cup? And I, and I replied, well, the Premier League is is a little bit like watching the World Cup every weekend because uh, you have these big stars uh, playing in in not just in in Britain but in in France, in Germany, in Spain, in in Italy as well. And I think what's really significant uh, the significant thing is is because of the influx of money from from the Gulf region in particular, but I think also private equity investment from the United States. We do now now have a, a whole number of clubs, principally European, um, in these five countries that I've mentioned, who are able to attract the top stars. And so, inevitably, you know, if you look at the if you look at the France starting eleven or the Argentina starting eleven, you know, for that matter, the, the Spain or the the Portugal starting elevens, instead of being 
players playing in their countries. They're actually players playing elsewhere overseas, very often for clubs that um, are owned by by uh, overseas owners. You know, we, we think about Alvarez, for example, for Argentina. He's playing for Manchester City, owned by Abu Dhabi. You know, at the same time, you, you've got others in, in the French team that are playing for clubs owned by you know, American private equity investors, for instance. So I think it's a reality of this kind of industrialized, commercialized global football that it's it's just inevitable that it's going to happen. But I do think the predominance of, of Qatar is interesting. The country has spent an awful lot of money preparing for this tournament and on football in general, somewhere upwards of about $250 billion. Keep your eye on Saudi Arabia because the same thing is starting to happen again. Yeah, Obviously, they just bought Sa Newcastle. They're, but they've not only bought Newcastle, but there are now strong stories that Saudi Arabia will bid to host the 2030 World Cup. Yeah. So, you know, keep in mind that Saudi Arabia is 10 times the size of Qatar in terms of population. So whatever we've had in terms of Sa in, in terms of Qatar, we're going to get even bigger and even glitzy with Saudi Arabia. And, and let's not forget that Lionel Messi is also uh, an ambassador already for Saudi Arabia. So... It's and, all and, comes and, together now. Yeah, and and strong stories too that Ronaldo is going there, and that potentially yeah. he'll the, the, the Messi and Ronaldo will serve as ambassadors for Saudi Arabia's World Cup bid. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, we we've been wondering in the last time uh, that you were on, gentlemen, we were asking uh, if the organizers were perhaps having buyer's remorse. There's been so many controversies during uh, this World Cup. Uh, uh, everything from uh, the, uh, the the fact that the players were not able to wear uh, a, a rainbow-colored armband. Uh, there were uh, more reports uh, about the way migrant workers were treated. The French president, well, he'll be back in Doha for the final on Sunday. Emmanuel Macron shrugging off those calls by activists for a diplomatic boycott of the tournament after a semi-final day tour of the souk in the Qatari capital. I take full responsibility. Four years ago, I was backing the French team in Russia. I'm supporting them in Qatar. I'm behind them and the French people as well. There had been a lot of debate. People said they would boycott the games. The numbers are here. We love our national team. We're proud of them. We want them to win. We'll support them until the end, and they're up to the task. It's fantastic. We're behind them. Aïda Lamy, your, your thoughts there? Uh, about what exactly? Uh, about uh, Emmanuel Macron saying that I assume complete responsibility. I'm going to Qatar, and you, you saw him in those images uh, with uh, uh, the Qatari scarf around his his neck when he was uh, touring the souk in Doha. I mean, that's, I think um, the, I, I wouldn't expect him to answer any differently. But at the same time, I think there has been very problematic coverage of Qatar in the sense that. Everything that has been said about the human rights abuses was uh, right, and, and the conversation should happen, and so on. But uh, no country is, is, uh, has been treated that way uh, when hosting the tournament. For instance, in four years, the next World Cup is going to be in the U.S., and I'm, I wonder if there's going to be a huge uh, conversation about the invasion of Iraq and the ca casualties uh, of that war and things like that. Uh, we well know that it won't be the case. And it's just interesting to see how how much Orientalism and racism has been involved in the coverage of Qatar, while, of course, not denying that everything was true when it came to talking about human rights abuses. Simon Chadwick, you, you, you made that point the last time uh, uh, we spoke. Uh, uh, can a tournament like this change a country? Can I answer that in a second? Because I want to come back to the issue of armbands, if I may, just briefly. And and we saw, obviously, in the global north, um, a big de debate about LGBTQ plus rainbow armbands. But as the tournament played out, we, of course, know that in the global south, the the, the um, debate about armbands about, was about whether or not uh, players should wear support for Palestinian armbands. And I think what, for me, the, 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 this World Cup has done is to highlight for us, you know, many of us across the world hold very different views about very similar subjects. And, and, and I hope that certainly as a global northerner, that my fellow global northerners now realise that just because we deem to debate about one particular thing, it doesn't mean that people sat in, you know, in Casablanca or Doha or Riyadh or wherever else are going to be talking about exactly the same things. But in terms of changing a country, uh, Qatar has changed. 
there's no doubt about it. For a start, if you go back 12 years when they, they first won the right to stage the tournament, um, there were no eight-lane highways, there was no metro network, there were no football stadiums. Was out. There were football stadiums, but none of the, the standard that we now see. So in terms of national development, in terms of infrastructure, it's changed. But I, the other thing I think as well, certainly talking to the Qataris that I know, is there's a much, there's a much stronger sense of national identity and self-confidence as well, I think. Selena Sykes, uh, what are the locals saying to you? Well, I think that's uh, completely correct, uh, Francois. I was actually here uh, around the same period of time uh, last year for the Arab uh, Cup, and there was very much a sense of excitement, this sense of pride uh, from uh, Qataris, and I think uh, that's uh, very much still the case uh, today. And, well, we've seen that football has really taken the centre stage at this World Cup. There has maybe, uh, to begin with, this kind of timid curiosity uh, from Qataris in the stadiums, obviously uh, a very different uh, footballing, uh, if we can call it footballing culture, to what we see in Europe and South America, but there, there has been a lot of interest. And uh, I would say that fans we've speak, spoken to as well on the whole have had a, a, a positive experience here. It may be a different demographic of fans uh, than we usually see. Obviously, uh, the cost of this World Cup is uh, something that we've spoken about a lot uh, amongst fans. It has been more expensive than usual uh, to come to Qatar, but the ones we've spoken to have generally said they've had a positive uh, experience. And uh, there was also a lot of talk about whether such a tiny country such as such as Qatar could handle uh, holding such a big international event and it has to be said that from at least what from what I have seen the 62 matches and the matches I've have attended have gone swimmingly well and I think that will also uh, be a big source of pride uh, for the Qatari people yeah and to pick up on Ida Lamy's point I'm not sure there are a lot of football fans who will not be looking forward to uh, matches at the next World Cup taking place across not just uh, uh, three times, four, four time zones, but across three countries. It's going to be in the U.S., Canada, and and Mexico. Uh, Ruben Slachter, 20 million people, uh, despite all the misgivings. Of course, the French are in the final. 20 million people here in France watched on Wednesday night the semifinal. Huge ratings. Yeah. What's it been like in the Netherlands? Yeah, for, uh, not not that not like that. Uh, it was really the the numbers are really disappointing in the Netherlands. Is it because of Qatar? Is it because of it's in the winter? We still don't know. They are now uh, researching it. But it's if you compare it for the last quarterfinal the Dutch played in, in 2014 against uh, Costa Rica. Now it was against Argentina. There were three million less people watching. So it was eight compared to five in five million now and eight million in in 2014. Why is that? I think that it's the, the the whole message around the tournament in the Netherlands was really, really negative all the time. Also because of the Dutch played quite badly. It's also not helping, but there was so many uh, discussion about so much discussion about everything happening uh, right there in Qatar. So the whole tournament came on was less important and, and it was almost you, you felt guilty to watch a game. That was really the sentiment in the country uh, during during the during the tournament. And now the Dutch are out, and there was even some kind of a relief, to be honest. So that's it's crazy to say because we've now heard as well that there's also a lot of positive sides. It's uh, but yeah, from the Netherlands' point of view, it was quite uh, it was quite negative from the start uh, till the end. So that's interesting, Simon Chadwick. You hear Ruben there saying how. Uh, uh, the Dutch uh, didn't have as good a squad as sometimes in the past, and that may have been a, a factor. As you rightly said, uh, England with its best team in, well, in a long, long time. And uh, uh, what have the ratings been like there? What kind of interest has there been since they've been eliminated? So I, I, I think that... Uh the English in particular, we're, we're great consumers of football rather than necessarily being great participants. And, and so the numbers uh, in general have held up pretty well. And, and and again, to the point that I made earlier about the political agenda in, in, in Britain, um, very often being you know, centre ground, we, we, we tend not to be too extreme in, in, in viewing these things. So Compared to, for example, Denmark, and and, and I was in Germany a, a few days before yeah. the tournament started, you know, really vehement criticism of Qatar. Yeah. There was some criticism in England of, of Qatar and the Qataris, but it, it was never so vehement. And so the numbers have held up. I, I think the big issue in, in England is... It's the time of the year because we're, we're talking about Christmas and shopping and getting ready for, uh, for all of the things that go with that. And, and so... 
it's been a somewhat unusual experience. I haven't sensed the hype around the streets of England as I might do in, in the summer, during the summer. And as I said, I think probably that's because of Christmas rather than because of any serious objection against Qatar. Well, that brings us to uh, the panel will not get away without a, a prediction uh, to the subject of uh, next uh, Sunday. Uh, uh, Aida Alami, let me begin uh, with you. Uh, what's your prediction for the final? Argentina wins, I think. I'm sorry, Francois. <laughs> as, as sorry you should be. Uh, Argentina <laughs> Argentina to win, says uh, Aida Alami. Selena, uh, break it down uh, for us here. I've got to go for the French Francois, not just because we're France 24, but I think there's a story uh, to be written here. Maybe not for Messi, but for Kylian Mbappe. We've seen from the beginning of this tournament, he is a man on a mission. Uh, you can really see that he uh, wants uh, to fulfill that quest uh, that France will become the first uh, country to retain a World Cup title since 1962. And it's a, a bit of a personal quest for him himself. Uh, he idolizes uh, Pele so much, and you can really uh, see that he definitely wants to write his name in history uh, as a player to have won uh, two World Cup titles, back-to-back -back World Cup titles. Ruben Slachter? Yeah, France will win on Sunday. And if I may add... Mar France will... You're very definitive. There. Yeah, 100%. Oh. They're much better than Argentina. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to say, but, but Argentina it's not... only played against average teams, and the Dutch were one of those average teams. I think that until now, uh, France uh, France has shown so much... But they have a better. culture of winning, and they... they yeah, and it's, everyone it's, said after their false start in the in, in, in the in, in the opening phase, yeah. oh, this team's slow, and, uh, and here they are in the final. It's their only chance because they will throw everything for Messi and to give him that that prize. But I think that France has, if you purely look at the quality of all the players combined, it's so much better. If I may just add on on uh, on Saturday, an important match as well. Morocco will win as well for a third place. So uh, just to uh, add because it's. Uh, it's important we've uh, we've learned here. So Simon Chadwick, take, talk us through the weekend here, Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> So I, I think the one thing that I would like to say is, is is one of the things that the veneration of Messi and Mbappe has done is is it's caught it has caused us to lose sight of of the best player of the tournament. Which is yeah. And 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 the best player of the tournament is the the player who will be on the winning side on Sunday. Um, I think France will win Sunday, and the best player of the tournament has been Antoine Griezmann. Yeah. Um, you know, I think he's been absolutely yeah. outstanding. Yeah. We, we we've we've been looking at Mbappe every single match, and in truth, Mbappe has been he's been okay. You know. He's been been good he's not been bad but Griezmann has been outstanding the other thing of course I've got to say is I do work in Paris and I do have to go into work on Monday morning so I have to, <laughs> I, so I so I have to say France anyway but I, I, I do genuinely believe that Griezmann will will help lead France to victory on Sunday yeah Griezmann yeah. and uh, couldn't agree more couldn't agree more Griezmann is by far and really by far the best player in this tournament and he didn't score yet so it's the perfect occasion on Sunday to uh, to score his first goal yeah lots lo lots of assists uh, one final question I'll put it to you Selena Sykes uh, uh, how's the officiating been in this tournament we saw uh, uh, there were some touch and go moments uh, during uh, uh, Argentina's uh, semi-final encounter There's been a lot of uh, debate, especially among uh, colleagues, Francois, about <laughs> uh, the uh, refereeing in uh, certain uh, games. Uh, even uh, I remember in the, the French England game, uh, there was uh, some uh, uh, calls about the refereeing. I think uh, in uh, general, though, uh, FIFA always going to uh, back the referees and their decisions, despite uh, some uh, questionable, uh, maybe at times, uh, decisions. But I think uh, on the whole, on the whole. Uh, it's a, it is what it is, and uh, FIFA will, will always back uh, the referees. <laughs> and will it be an away match for France like it was with the semi final? I think uh, that will most certainly be the case. I would say after the Moroccans, we've definitely seen a lot of Argentinian uh, fans. It really, uh, they are really an exceptional fan base. Every time that we've uh, been to their uh, stadiums outside, they are by far uh, the ones that go home the latest. They are always uh, outside the stadiums until the early hours whilst we're doing our shows. Uh, and so I think they will definitely be outnumbered in that stadium and uh, the French will uh, have to prepare for another difficult game in terms of atmosphere. Fans who stick around to party, that's a point in favor of the Alba Ceste. I want to thank you, uh, Selena Sykes, for, uh, for being with us uh, from Doha with our outstanding coverage uh, throughout this tournament. Uh, Simon Chadwick in Coventry, uh, Aida Alami in the Moroccan capital, Rabat Ruben Slachter. Thank you for being with us here 
in the France 24 debate.